DJ Valentino here with Ian Wheeler from Partisan Records. How are you doing today, Ian? I'm doing all right. Good stuff, good stuff. How are you handling quarantine right now? I'm handling, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, we have a yard, so we're, we're keeping sane by sitting outside. Yeah, at least you can, like, you know, go out and, like, experience a little bit of fresh air. I feel bad for people and, you know, apartment buildings and stuff that are trapped in a small space. Me too. Yeah, mm. outdoor space is, is critical right now. Definitely, definitely. So now the first thing I really want to dive in, you recently wrote an article for the New York Times about why creativity from artists specifically will not thrive in this environment. And I know I've been hearing it in all the radio industry, on social media, from fans, everywhere, that um, this quarantine is actually quote unquote beneficial because it'll allow these artists to release these great albums and these great you know music and all these awesome punk songs. And you make a really awesome debate on why that, that is absolutely not the case. Could you kind of explain to our listeners who maybe haven't read the article yet what it's about? Sure, yeah. I mean, uh, look, I think it's very possible that creativity will thrive in this time. But, um, you know, I think it's, it's kind of unfair that we put this pressure on artists for it to thrive, um, you know, especially given the circumstances. And, and this particular crisis is really terrible for artists. Um, you know, it hits them really directly in their livelihood insofar as most artists make their, their income touring, um, playing shows. And, and as we know by now, that, that's probably the last thing that will come back, um, you know, for, out of this crisis. So I, I think artists are in a really impossibly difficult situation. And when you pair that with the pressure to create these, these groundbreaking, amazing things to make all of us other people feel better, um, you know, I think that's undue pressure. Um, you know, and, and really the better conversation is not, oh, people are going to create amazing things out of this. It's how can we help artists and, and you know, protect them um, so that they're in a position to be able to create amazing things for us uh, to make us feel better. Um, so that, that's kind of where I'm coming from. And look, I think this really kind of lays bare a lot of issues in the music industry that, that mm -hmm. we haven't been willing to address for a long time. Um, you know, the music industry, we made one really critical mistake uh, several years ago when we kind of turned, turned a blind eye towards um, downloading and, and, you know, the way the Internet was approaching music. And, you know, we let consumers be OK or, or be comfortable getting their music for free and, you know, expecting that that would be the case. And that kind of paved the way for Spotify, which I don't think is a bad thing, but you know, we haven't figured out how to monetize that in a way, in a way that's fair towards artists. And, and even as I speak, Spotify is in the courts fighting to pay artists even less um, at a time where they need even more. Um, so I think it really is a, a look, it's a, it's a great opportunity for us to rethink the way we compensate people who create the things that make us feel better. Um, mm. and, and so I think that that's kind of what my, my article was. It was a call to you know, hey, let's pause, let's not put this pressure on artists to make these things, but let's make sure they're being taken care of and let's rethink the way we do business, um, you know, and create a more equitable system for them. Definitely, definitely. And I know that um, one super interesting thing that you wrote in the article that I absolutely, I, it really clicked for me and it made sense is in no other profession when the hardships are really, really tough, do we put this pressure on these people? And, and it's true. I can't think of another career path where when times get going, we think, oh, well, you, you'll do your best at that point, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it, it really is strange. Um you know, I think on a base level, it kind of makes sense. And, and I've always, as someone who's worked with artists for the last 15 years in every imaginable capacity, <laughs> I've, I've thought this way sometimes, unfortunately, where I'm like, oh, you know, his, his girlfriend left him. Uh, you know, his life's kind of a, a disaster. He might write something great, you know, at this moment out, out of that pain. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and I realize the error in, in my ways at this point of, of thinking that way. There's just no other circumstance, as you said, where, you know, if we make someone's life so much harder, they're going to, their work output's going to be even better. Um, so, yeah, I, I think, you know, we really need to think kind of critically about taking care of, of these artists that we love.
Mm -hmm. Definitely. And I know that I'm a, a huge fan of the you know lead singer syndrome with Shane Told from Silverstein. And on one of the podcasts, it really kind of opened my eyes was um, he had the Dan Soupy from the Wonder Years on. And I think Soupy even talked about how people assume that because an artist can like sell out a bigger venue that they make a ton of money. And in reality, the way the music industry is set up now, they make about the same as a teacher. And in times like this, where it, it's not even like, you know, there's like nothing going on for months even years it, it can be definitely very stressful for them i totally see you know yeah yeah i mean our our perception and this is true of myself but, you know again as someone who's been in this industry for 15 years working with with artists at every size every level um you know i have artists that play huge venues but you know the next year they they can't sell nearly as many tickets for for one reason or another i mean especially at this point Things are algorithmically driven. Um, you know, you might have, you might be on a few Spotify playlists today that are generating tons of plays for you, but you know, it could be next year none of that exists for you. Um, you know, I think the artists that are set up best are the ones that have the the most dedicated fan bases, um, and for the most part, those aren't aren't the biggest artists. Um, but it's really hard to know where each artist is is at individually. Um, you know, and I, I do think it's time for us to stop thinking, oh, this person's at this level, they make this much money, because uh, in all likelihood, you can't guess their income. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I You're probably right. can't either. Definitely, definitely. Um, and you brought up an interesting point about, again, like running the label especially in times like this, you have so much experience of running a record label, but this is really unprecedented. How are you guys like managing this new, you know, area to traverse? Um, so a, a lot of it goes, I mean, you know, in some ways everything has changed at this point. Um, in other ways it hasn't, you know, it's say in the ways that it hasn't, I think our core mission is to look at each artist on an individual level um, you know, identify what makes them special, what, you know, what gets their fans excited and, and really pursue that. Um, you know, for some artists, it's, it's the personal connection they feel like they have with their fans. Um, so maybe that's through social media. Maybe it means the artist is going on Instagram every day and, and doing a little session or something like that. Um, you know, for other artists, it's, it's a different thing. Um, and so I, I think, you know, across the board right now, people, smart people at good labels are really trying to focus on each artist individually and figure out, you know, what they should be doing at this moment. And also having conversations with the artists about what they're comfortable doing at this moment. I think not every artist is comfortable, um, you know, putting themselves out there at a time like this. And that's perfectly understandable in, in mm -hmm. you know, every possible way. Is like the mission right now, especially in these like weird times to, almost grow the fan base or just keep the fan base that's stuck at home satisfied with content, you know? It's definitely to grow the fan base, um, you know, where the artists are comfortable. Like I said, mm. I think for, for some artists, certainly some I've talked to feel like, hey, this is not my moment. Um, you know, if they feel like maybe it's exploitative in some way, kind of putting themselves out there and, and expecting something in return at a time when so many people are suffering or on the front lines of actually battling, um, this epidemic, the pandemic, excuse me. Um, so, you know, it, it's really case by case. Um, I think there is a fear with touring going away that, you know, there are a lot of artists that had a lot of momentum that were going to have spring tours, summer tours. Um, you know, are you losing fans by, by not playing those shows? And I think that's a real concern. Um, but, you know, hopefully there's some different online strategies to, to mitigate that. Um, I think other artists and, and what they do during this time, they're going to pick up quite a few fans, um, you know, and that's going to be really interesting to see. Uh, but yeah, I've definitely talked to quite a few artists that, that I'm very close with who say I'm not an online person and, mm -hmm. you know, this just ain't my ain't my time. Yeah. And and I'm sure, again, like the artists, you know, a lot of them are struggling. Even the, the, the successful ones are su struggling as well as, you know, the more smaller tier ones. Um, one of the things that Partisan Records, you guys kind of partnered with the um, the knitting factory in Brooklyn. And, you know, um, you know, you guys kind of grew together. How are you seeing these venues kind of handle this? Because I know the artists are struggling. I'm sure that the venues are taking a hit, too, in this time. I mean, the venues are, are, you know, the venues and the artists are taking the, the biggest hit. 
Um, you know, the, the booking agencies as well, although, you know, the big, the big booking agencies, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't, we're not crying over William Morris or, or, or <laughs> Paradigm at the moment, although, you know, we have lots of friends there and, and we want the best for them. Um, but yeah, I mean, the venues we think about a lot, especially the, the small and independent venues. Um, you know, I know Knitting Factory is doing weekly live streams on Twitch. Um, they're really right now focusing on artists in the LA area and they're actually, you know, sending them high quality video equipment. Um, Twitch has been a great partner featuring those, those sessions on their homepage. Um, you know, one of my biggest concerns has been the discoverability of all these live streams. Um, you know, how do people find out that they're happening apart from just the social media, uh, channels of, of the artists. Um, but yeah, so, I mean, they're, the tech companies need to step up as well, um, and support artists and, you know, for tech companies, I, I think Twitch had kind of been wanting to get into music. This is a great opportunity for them and, and they're absolutely seizing upon it. Um, you know, and, and featuring a lot of music content, working closely with the creators to, to do that. Um, but yeah, for the venues, it's kind of, you know, stop the bleeding as much as possible and until we're in the clear. Um, but it's going to be a while. Yeah. And, um, again, you mentioned kind of like the Instagram live beforehand, you just mentioned the Twitch streaming. How do you, like, are, are you obviously are in favor of, you know, these artists kind of, um, you know, if they're comfortable with it, doing these live streams, do the artists, uh, are, are the majority of them adapting or, or are the majority of them kind of having a hard time with it or accepting it, you know? I'd say the majority of them are, are adapting. I mean, I think, you know, one key trait of, of most artists, the vast majority of artists, is they're very empathetic people. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and so I think their instinct is to put themselves out there in a way that, that can help people feel better. Um, and so I've seen a lot of that. I, I know I have a media company called Talk House. We did our first live uh, conversation between two artists last week on Instagram with Elado Negro and, and uh, Busca Bella, who's a phenomenal Puerto Rican band that, that just had a new album come out. And it was amazing. It was so heartfelt. Um, they already knew each other and they were friends, but they were having a very real conversation about you know, the situation and, and kind of what they were doing in quarantine, um, how they were feeling about their personal finances. And, and it was just very real. Um, and I know it made me feel better. Uh, we have another one this week on Wednesday with uh, Julian Baker and Katie Harkin, who plays in Slater Kinney and, and Courtney Barnett's band. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, look, I, I think if you're making really personal content and putting yourself out in the world, then it absolutely has the ability to make people feel better. Um, you know, so it, 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 I think it's great that artists are doing that. I do think at some point, we're going to need, you know, again, going back to the music industry's kind of uh, not original sin, but, you know, uh, their mm -hmm. modern key sin. We need to make sure people are going to be comfortable paying for these live streams, um, you know, and, and we can't mm -hmm. keep putting things out there for free. Otherwise, we're, we're going to kneecap the artists and, and their ability to, to continue to make revenue. Yeah. And I just feel bad for the artists in the sense that, um, like when you're at a live concert, you know, the crowd's going crazy, the crowd's cheering and they feed off the crowd and they put on like a more energetic show. And then the crowd feeds off that. And it's this awesome circle of like energy kind of exchange. Whereas with the live streams, it can be tough because, you know, you have your phone kind of on a stand or whatever you're using to record. And there's not really that real exchange. So I imagine there's going to be a definite hurdle for these artists to kind of get over for these next few months, you know? Uh, yeah, I mean, you hit the nail on the head. You know, it, in my conversations with artists, that's kind of the first thing they say is that it's not the same remotely. Um, you know, and, and that kind of fountain of hearts that you see in the corner of the screen, that that, that is just no way comparable to the feeling of, of having, you know, an audience standing right there in front of you, giving you that, that feedback. Um, so I, I think it's a challenge, you know, I think artists are going to have to adapt in that way. And, and I don't know. I mean, there's not a lot you could say. It's kind of like, hopefully this makes, you know, real crowd applause even more meaningful when, when, you know, we go mm. back to live music, but um, I don't think that's much consolation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, 
how do you see the music industry landscape kind of being all after this? You know, like maybe like a year down the line when all of the dust has settled and everything is kind of resembling back to a normal state. It, the music industry isn't going to be the same. What sort of changes do you think you're going to see in that time frame? Well, look, my hope is that there'll be a really bus, robust, um, you know, online kind of live stream setup but where artists can actually make money, you know, playing shows from home. Um, I hope that's something that sticks around. I know it's something that, you know, more pioneering artists like Fish have gotten right in the past. I mean, I, I have people that I grew up with that are accountants in North Carolina that, you know, Friday nights they put on that Fish live stream and, you know, they, after they put the kids to bed. And, you know, look, there are people who can't go out on the road and follow that band around because um, they have kids and they have jobs and, and stuff like that. But it'd be great to see like a, a thriving economy, um, you know, a sector of the music industry that, that we create out of this for that, where people, you know, are fine paying 20 bucks for, for a live stream like that. And, you know, sitting at home, popping a bottle of wine, watching a, a show. Um, a friend of mine owns a festival called Shaky Knees in Atlanta. And, and he broadcasts like a My Morning Jacket concert on Friday night. And it blew my mind. I mean, it was, mm. uh, you know, uh, I don't know. It was just really cool and, and fun and exciting to, to, to watch that. Um, so I hope that sticks around. You know, I think we're going to see a lot of promoters and, and venues uh, go away, unfortunately. Mm. And my hope is that, um, you know, people are really excited to see shows again. We can get some, some investors coming into the space, um, you know, fired up about the new possibilities. And we can start some, some new independent promotion companies. Um, and hopefully those companies are more focused on the artists and, and their livelihood. I mean, I think the biggest thing is if we can build more of a, a support net for artists, then, you know, we'll, we'll have come out on top. And I definitely agree. Like we almost take for granted how like all these live streams are free and all over the place. Like right now, especially in the music industry, they're everywhere. And um, it, if we don't pay the artist, we're going to get used to not paying the artist. You know, if, right. if this goes on for longer, like if we have another four or six months of just continuous live streams without paying for it, we might not even consider paying for the $20 live stream. So, right. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, we just can't get in that habit of, of expecting it for free. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and it, as a music, look, I grew up in the era of, of LimeWire and stuff. And I, I remember, I, I think I was about 19 when I realized like, oh, this is wrong. I mean, you know, I shouldn't be effectively stealing all this music. It was a gray area. It was like, oh, we're trading files, you know, so this is like trading Grateful Dead tapes or something. Mm -hmm. um, but it crystallized. It became clear that, that it was wrong. And But it took a while to, you know, for iTunes to, to become a thing and to be comfortable paying for music in that way. I think we really need to expedite, um, you know, across the board from the artists and managers, um, you know, to the, to the technology companies that are giving us the tools to do these things. We really need to expedite that process and, and make sure that everyone's comfortable paying for these things. Yeah. So now another question that I have is something that I've been thinking about with these newer artists that haven't really even like thought about breaking out yet and they want to wait till after the quarantine's over. Do you think it's going to be harder for them to break into the industry or easier for them to break into the industry with all that's happened this past year? It's a tough question. I mean, I think, uh, you know, I think touring wise, it, it'll probably be, you know, at the, at the very base level, as far as house shows, there are going to be a lot of opportunities, right? Um, you know, and, and really small clubs, the ones that can survive this, you know, which is a big question mark. Um, I think for the artists in the middle and, and you know, further up, uh, it's going to be a real competition for spots at venues. There are going to be fewer venues and, and all the dates are already held. Um, you know, I mean, you're talking about probably right now, most dates are held through uh, 18 months from now, um, just with tours mm -hmm. getting rescheduled and, you know, plans that, that were already set into motion before all this. Um, so there's going to be a lot of competition for who actually gets to go out on tour. Um, but yeah, I think for artists thinking about launching something, I mean, now's a good time to be writing and recording if you have the, you know, bandwidth capacity to do that, um, if you're in the right mental space to do that. Um, 
you know, it's a good time to start really focusing on building an online presence. And, you know, hopefully by the time we're out of this, you have a good sense of, you know, whether you could go out in the road and, and break even or, or just get people in a room. Mm, definitely, definitely. And uh, another thing I wanted to address that is kind of very interesting, Partisan Records have offices in New York, London, like California. So you guys really do have like a broad network uh, ac across everywhere. Do you notice artists in particular areas having a harder time than others in terms of just like pressure and being forced to get this creativity or no? I mean, I think the pressure is, is pretty ubiquitous. I mean, mm -hmm. I think, um, look, artists in bigger cities with higher rents, they're going to have a harder time. Um, you know, just places where the cost of living is higher uh, with no income, uh, obviously it, it, you're having a much harder go of it. Um, you know, that said, I mean, there are a lot of places like Durham, North Carolina, where there are these thriving communities of artists. Um, Durham, Sylvanesso is there, Y Oak is there, his Golden Messenger is there. Um, you know, and they're all friends and, and it's a community and they're all supporting each other. So I, I think probably those artists are having an easier time uh, to an extent, at least just you have a support network of people who are all going through the same thing as you are. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, uh, I think it's going to be a mixed bag. I mean, I think across the board, not just artists, but we might see a lot of people move away from from big cities with high rents, um, you know, and, and kind of think, hey, maybe I don't need to be in New York in person to go meet with different people. Maybe it's something that can just happen over Zoom, um, you know, and I can live in a cheaper place that's that has a higher quality of life. Um, mm. So we'll see. I, I, I do think that's a, a likely outcome. Yeah, and, and definitely. And I think you're right. I could definitely see a lot of like these, you know, really expensive cities like, like L.A. and New York, kind of like the artists moving away from that vicinity. Um, just after after all this, the dust has settled. Uh, and then I got one more question for you. Um, sure. You obviously have to talk house and talk house is super awesome. You have a lot of great content. And, you know, you have these podcasts with artists, filmmakers, actors, kind of everybody in the creative spectrum, which is super cool. Um, do you think that like the the podcasting and like video aspects are going to get more creatively out there now that you know like people like like talk house have the equipment and you guys have like you're stuck in quarantine do you think that that aspect of the entertainment industry might thrive a little bit during this time frame or no i do yeah i mean mm. i think so right now um you know there's no film or tv production um there is podcast production so i, I think you know certainly in a few months, three to six months from now, we're going to see a real vacuum with, with TV and film um, when there's just not a lot of stuff coming out. Um, and we're going to see, you know, all these people have had time to create podcasts in, in quarantine. We're going to see some pretty cool, impressive podcast output. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think that could be, you know, an interesting thing to come out of this. I, I also think for any creative or, or artist, I mean, podcasting is a great form. Um, you know, it's a great way to gather up your audience, have a dialogue with them, um, you know, share things with them in, in a, a really intimate, personal format. Um, so it, that's been one silver lining of this. I mean, we've had so many artists, even more, kind of come to us and say, hey, I finally want to start that podcast. Um, and, and so that's been great. We're working on a ton of those now. We're working on a podcast series where musicians talk with scientists. I, I think that one's going to be really cool. We're already working mm. on that. And, you know, now in, in light of this pandemic, uh, it should be even more interesting. Um, so I, I just think it's a really cool, you know, format. And, and I think for the entertainment industry, you know, we've seen a lot of things start at podcasts and then maybe they go to TV it's a good way to kind of test things out and find an audience before you take all the risk. Um, so I, I, I'm optimistic about the podcast space for sure. Definitely, definitely. Well, again, thank you so much again for talking to me today. It's been an absolute pleasure having you. We really appreciate you taking time out of your day to come talk to WSU about kind of, you know, the ins and outs of the industry and what's going on right now. Thanks for having me. It was great, great to talk with you. Uh, great questions. I really appreciate it.